In this section, we'll be talking about the golden rules of ECG interpretation. Today's course is more than simple interpretation. It involves understanding the pathophysiology and pharmacology so you can be confident in your care and treatment of a patient. And these golden rules will help you take into consideration the elements of an ECG so that you can work to the full capacity of your profession. Number one, an ECG is never viewed in isolation. They are completed and examined in conjunction with other clinical pieces such as a physical exam, a patient's history, lab results, looking at their medication profile, and a previous ECG if they have it, and future repeated ECGs. Now, if you're working with an unresponsive patient, there are still methods to gather that vital information. Taking the patient's vital signs, looking at their blood work, getting their past medical history if their file is available. We can do bedside ultrasounds to look for fluid collections. We can do x-rays to assess the respiratory and cardiac function and look for fractures, auscultation of the lungs, and the list goes on. Now this is not an exhaustive list, obviously, but just a reminder that patients do provide information even though they may be unresponsive or they cannot speak the language that we are engaging with. Number two, use an orderly approach to ECG analysis. Developing a, system, a systematic approach will ensure that you have considered all the elements of the ECG. Now this data gives you detailed information about the underlying rhythm and the areas of insult or injury along with guiding our interventions. We want to avoid errors in diagnosis that would lead to inappropriate treatment options. Number three, if the ECG does not make sense or match the clinical presentation or history of your patient, repeat the ECG. And the first question I want you to think of is, is the lead placement correct? When an ECG does not make sense, there are some things to look for when assessing lead placement. Most commonly, misplaced leads are the right arm and the left arm have been transposed. They're sitting on the wrong arm. And this can cause a result of cardiac pathology on the ECG tracing as it causes some of the leads to look reversed. The second most common issue is the right arm and leg limbs have been reversed. And this will cause our lead two to be extremely flat. Next, I want you to check the chest leads. If they are too high on the chest or incorrectly placed, this will also cause an abnormal picture on the ECG tracing. And then of course there are physiological changes to consider. If all the limbs are in the right place, if all the limb leads are in the right place, it may be normal for your male patient to show what we call a slurred J point, and we'll talk about this in the future. However, if a 60-year-old with a smoking history also shows that same slurred J point, we would want to do some further investigations. Number four, we want to treat the patient. There we go. Number four, treat the patient and not the monitor. I cannot tell you, it is so common that healthcare providers will stand there and watch the cardiac monitor to see for changes. But not all arrhythmias will create changes in your patient's clinical presentation. So while some will require more aggressive treatments, others will require no intervention. So we want to be making sure that we're focusing on the patient. Recall here that the cardiac monitor or ECG tracing is only showing us a picture of the electrical activity of the heart. And the only way to know if this is impacting your patient is to assess them. Now a patient with a perfusing pulse is treated very differently than one without a perfusing pulse. So let me give you an example. We have these two patients and Bob is in bed A and we'll say Jim is in bed B. Now Bob has a heart rate of 80 on the monitor and it looks to be in sinus rhythm. When we assess Bob, he also has a strong pulse and a good blood pressure. Now Jim in the beds beside him also shows a heart rate of 80 and when we go to assess him, he has no pulse. Although these two have the same rhythm on the monitor, one of them needs immediate intervention. And I hope you pick Jim because he's clinically dead. So it is common practice and good practice to always check your patient's pulse and blood pressure when you first see the patient 
and of course a complete set of vital signs, anytime their condition changes, or when you don't know what to do. This will give you time to consider other elements and get the appropriate people in place. Number five, treat the patient and not yourself. Now this may sound a little silly, but some patients will have a scary looking ECG rhythm and this can cause healthcare providers to feel extremely uncomfortable. So if your heart rate is starting to go up and you're starting to feel unstable, take a seat. It doesn't mean that your patient is unstable. We need to look at signs and symptoms of that decreased cardiac output. I wanna share a story. I had a patient, I was working in eMERGE, and he was probably in his mid 20s if I recall correctly, and he came in not feeling well. He was put on the monitor, and I had happened to walk by him at one point, and his heart rate was in the high 30s. I'm gonna say about 38. Well, my heart rate suddenly escalated. I became tachycardic, and I was like, oh my God, we need to pace this patient. I was so happy that my nurse I was working with grabbed me by the shoulders, turned me around and said, look at your patient. He was kind of smirking and laughing at me a little bit at that time because he was rosy, he was reading a magazine, he was able to talk with me coherent, no changes in his level of consciousness. He was fine. I, on the other hand, was having a small coronary because I was thinking about the rules of advanced cardiac life support. Bradycardic pace, but I forgot to look at the patient. So of course, sometimes we may feel uncomfortable, but always assess the patient and care for them first. Number six is ECGs inform treatment options. This is one tool that we're going to use to help guide the patient's treatment. So it is a valuable assessment. There are two questions we ask when looking at an ECG. Number one, is the ECG normal or abnormal? And number two, is the patient stable or unstable? Remember signs and symptoms, signs and symptoms of an unstable patient are related to that decreased cardiac output and they can include things such as a decreased level of consciousness, they're becoming more confused, harder to wake up, they might be feeling faint, diaphoretic, they could be short of breath and their blood pressure may be low. They can also have complaints of chest pain and at its worst, the patient is pulseless. So unstable patients should be treated immediately with one of three electrical interventions. We're either going to pace them and that is when their heart rate is really slow and they are symptomatic. Not my patient who I just talked about who had a pulse rate of 38 and was fine. We're going to cardiovert them. So an unstable patient with a really fast rhythm, we're going to cardiovert. Now there are some exceptions there. Sinus tachy and chronic atrial fibrillation, we do not cardiovert. And defibrillating is the third electrical intervention and that's when we have an unstable patient that's in ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Now I wanna just come back to that sinus tachy for a moment. Heart rates of greater than 100 and up to approximately 150, where you can see the P wave it's present, they will not respond to cardioversion. And in fact, a shock may actually increase their heart rate. So the treatment for sinus tachycardia is aimed at fixing the underlying cause, such as relieving pain, replacing fluid volume, or anxiety. Now in your package, you will have a diagram that looks like this and a chart of medications. We're gonna to refer to this as we work through the various arrhythmias. Now some patients may, may not require electrical interventions, rather they can be corrected with other modalities such as medications, electrolyte replacement, and fluid replacement. We want to ensure in this course that you understand the reason for the treatment and the anticipated outcomes. So we'll be referring back to this page often throughout the course. Now let's get on to our seventh golden rule, and that is after every intervention, we need to assess effectiveness. This will be requiring a repeat ECG, and we're gonna compare it to the one that we did before the intervention, and we wanna know if the patient has changed. So if you gave a normal saline bolus, for example, did that improve blood pressure, and did that convert the heart rhythm back into something that was more conducive to the health of the patient? If you gave a calcium channel blocker, did that lower the heart rate? 
If you had to give adenosine, did it convert the heart rate out of the funky rhythm back into a normal rhythm or a perfusing rhythm as we would call it? It doesn't always come back into sinus rhythm and that's an important piece to know as well. So this concludes the section on the golden rules. You will have a download in a download or you have this in your package uh, that you can have and refer to this often.